It is good to see everyone here this morning, and uh, we just want to invite everyone, uh, appreciate our visitors being with us, and invite everyone to, uh, we have our fifth Sunday meal together and also a graduation celebration for Ryan, and invite everyone to, to stay with us. Uh, this morning, we're looking at the words that Peter actually asks, is to whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? And let's just, let's just look at our scripture. So we're going to, to John chapter 6, beginning in verse 66. From that time, and there's a lot of things to say about this. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Now, the text says disciples. It doesn't say just kind of uh, marginal people people that had a mild interest, people that were just uh, sort of looking in his direction. It says specifically, his disciples walked with him no more. You mean a disciple of Christ can suddenly decide not to walk with him anymore? And obviously, that's the case. Obviously, that is the case. And he's going to ask a question concerning this. But why would they not walk with him anymore? Is because they didn't like the teaching. They didn't like the teaching. It was the words, not the work, not the miracles. They loved the miracles. If all he ever did, Jesus of Nazareth, was come upon this earth and do miracles, he would have been loved by everybody not just Israel either but by everybody but there was something matched in with those miracles because the miracles aren't there just for the sake of miracles miracles are present were present for a reason and it was to confirm something the messenger well if there's a messenger if it confirms a messenger there must be a message well yeah there is a message and it's the message they don't like they didn't like the message that he presented to them, and it was the Word of God. It's what it actually took to be a disciple, to truly, truly be a disciple. Now, the Bible refers to them as disciples, so they are disciples, but for someone who's actually going to stick with him, is going to be sticking with him, with his, with his teaching with every word that he says and following that. It's not a matter of options of I'll take some of it and others I'll examine later. It's I'm going to take all of it. Whatever, whatever I'm told, that is what I will take. Now, one may think that's kind of a, a naive sort of approach. All right, but when you discover that this is from God, and when you discover, when you come to a conclusion that God will never let me down, then I can know, when you can know, that we can take every good thing that God tells us. We can take it as being the truth and we can found our life right on top of it. Every single action. Every action. Now, verse 67. Then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? So he he's addresses the apostles. The apostles are still there. They haven't left. But go and read John chapter 4 and realize how many thousands of people had been following him. They had been there. They had been following him. And among these people, you have, of course, the apostles. And the apostles, now the apostles don't leave. But he asks them, do you also want to go away? Is this what you want to do? And we have Simon Peter speaking out again, and he's saying something very similar, very similar to what he said in, uh, in Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus asked, but who do you say that I am? And he says, Peter answers, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He's going to say something very similar, but he's going to say some other things too. But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. All right, you have the words of eternal life. 
Where are we going to go? And that's our question for today. Where else is there? And the answer is nowhere else. The world presents all kinds of options. Satan presents all kinds of options. The options are out there, but all of them lead to a terrible end. Every one of them. None of them give any real hope. None of them, it's just empty. None of them give a richness of life. None of them can give you spiritual blessings. Nobody. Nobody can do it. But verse 69, Also we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Okay. Now we just want to to look now in this. His disciples walked with Him no more. They had been with Him, but they're not walking with Him anymore. Why? We already made mention of that. It's His teaching. It's His teaching. And to this very day, there are people who will follow Christ's teaching. They'll follow it even when it proves to be initially painful. It's not a pleasant thing to have a stark light shine on your mistakes. And some people think of that's all the Bible is. It's just this, this painful light that shows your sins, that shows your flaws, that shows uh, what a weak individual you are, and who wants that. That's all they can think about it. Now, it does do that. It does do that. And it would be a cruel thing if that's all it ever did. But it shows salvation. It shows that while we're all guilty of sin, every one of us, we don't have to be under that guilt anymore. That we can stand before God pure, innocent, and all of the sin, all of the guilt washed away forever. That is a message of mercy. That is a message of love. That's a message that God brings. That's the message of the Bible, the message of Christ. Now, John chapter 6, the people there, all those thousands, all they really wanted, well, first off, they wanted to force him to be king. They were going to force him to be king. And that's not going to happen. He wasn't going to allow that to happen. They also saw things from a materialistic standpoint only. He fed them miraculously. That's what they wanted. They wanted to continue in that. If they have a king who can feed them miraculously, guess what you can do? <laughs> or guess what you don't have to do, I should say. You don't have to raise crops. You don't have to work in the fields. You don't have to raise cattle. You don't have to do any of those things. You don't have to fish. You don't have to make bread. You don't have to do any of those things because you have a king right there that can miraculously present food from very little. He can feed people by the thousands. Well, that would make for a very impressive leader. But that's not who Christ is. Christ brought a teaching that don't go after just the things that are, just after food, after the materialistic things. Go after the things that are spiritual. That's what's important. Go after what is eternal, not this temporary place we're at here. Things that are eternal because this stay here is very quick indeed. It's very quick. And I have heard it from too many who have known that in my eyes they would have been very old in telling me appreciate what you got, appreciate this, appreciate that, because it all goes fast. And next thing I know, I see, wow, it all went fast. <laughs> I'm still here, granted, but it all went fast. And it does. We need something that is far greater. 
But he asks a, this question, and it's to his apostles, do you also want to go away? Peter answers with the question, Lord, to whom shall we go? And so we need to ask this question. Then he gives two reasons for, the, for his question. Who are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. Okay, that's number one. You have the words of eternal life. Nothing else can give us that. You think the rabbis can give us that? You think Caesar can give us that? You think Herod can give us that? They can't. Z uh, being a zealot, it can give us that. Being any of these sects of the Jews, they can give us that. They can't. They can't. Greek philosophy, Roman paganism, what can any of those give us? Can they give us eternal life? And Peter comes to this conclusion, you have the words of eternal life. And notice, the people who have left and walked with him no more, those disciples, he had presented them with the words of life. They didn't want it. They didn't want those words of life. But that's what they are, words of life. They're eternal. Then he says this, we also have come to believe and know. that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. All right, I'm saying this as an affirmation. I'm saying this not as a bragging point, but truly, if one asks me, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? My answer is, not only do I believe it, I know it's true. And I wasn't even back there, neither are you. Not even back there to see those miracles, to see it confirmed. I can know it to be true, like they knew it to be true. It's not just, he could be, and we better kind of put all of our eggs in that basket because he could be the Christ. It's that, yeah, all your bags, your entire, all your eggs can be in that basket. All your entire life can be resting on him because you can know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, because the Bible teaches us that. And before all the critics and the skeptics have their laugh, just understand it proves it as well. How does it prove it? The Bible knows too much through prophecy. And it knows too much of the ancient past that as we were just mentioning in our Bible class with the life of Abram, or Abraham, that there are, there are details of that ancient world that no one could have proven. But the Bible spoke of them. No one could have proven them until archaeologists found that, yeah, here's that people. There was doubt concerning the Hittites. Yeah, we sort of found their civilization. Did you know they had writing? <laughs> yeah, and there, there it is. There it is, that, that the Bible got it right. And the Bible always gets it right. And it gets it right concerning its Messiah, its Christ. It gets it right through the prophecies. And in those prophecies, as we studied not too long ago in a sermon, of the Christ had to come within a specific time and a specific people. And if He doesn't, then He can't arrive at all. The whole thing is false. But if He does, and I mean inside a span of a small window in human history. If he doesn't come within that span, and actually it comes down to one year, if he's not present on this earth in that year, he's not coming at all. But he came, and he was here. And I'm referring to the prophecies in Daniel. That's what I'm referring to, and it's not just uh, that of of uh, making things up or that of, of turning to, to something where it's unprovable, it's very provable as a matter of fact. But Peter says, yeah, we know. We know you're the Christ. You, because it comes down to it's impossible for anyone else to be the Christ and it's impossible for Jesus not to be the Christ. He's got to be the Christ. Now, he asked, Lord, to whom shall we go? And that's a good question. And I'm going to quote to you someone I've never quoted from this pulpit before. You may know him. You may not know him. Doesn't matter. His name was David Foster Wallace. 
He died in 2008. He was a writer, highly regarded among a lot of your literate people. Highly regarded. Uh, he isn't necessarily someone who was uh, overwhelmingly popular in his books, but among the, the uh, uh, people with uh, just pride themselves in literary background, they would very well know this name. Now, it cannot be said at all that David Forrester, or I'm sorry, David Foster Wallace, that David Foster Wallace was a Christian. It cannot be said that in the least. And you can know that from his writing. But I'm going to quote him because what he says is true. What he says. This is coming from a man basically hedonistic. Basically, uh, we, we just living life however he pleased. He says, in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there's actually no such thing as atheism. I have said that, and I know people will think that I'm the only one that says it. I am not. I am not the only one that says that. There's actually no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. That's the choice what to worship. Now Christ also said that. We'll get to that in a minute. But Christ also said that. And I'm not sure, I, I guess he knew that Christ would have agreed with him on this. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in, your, in life, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. It's the truth. So here's money. Now, I don't know if Mr. Wallace knew that he was repeating the findings from Ecclesiastes. But he is. He is repeating those findings because evidently he found them himself. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly and when time and age start showing you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. On one level, we all know this stuff already. It's been codified as myths, proverbs, cliches, epigrams, parables, the skeleton of every great story. If you worship power, you will feel weak and afraid and you will need ever more power in others to keep the fear at bay. Having a little is not enough. You worship these things, you must have more of it. Worship your intellect being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. Our attachments are our temple. What we worship, no. And isn't that so? What we give ourselves to, what we invest with faith, attachments are of great seriousness. Choose your attachments carefully. Now, here is what we have in Matthew. Jesus saying, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. You know, this is exactly what he's talking about. He's agreeing with Christ that there is always the fear that what you worship will be taken from you or that it will be seen as well, it, it becomes the master of everything is what it does. And it's temporary it comes to a dead end, which is exactly what is meant in those words in Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanity, all is vanity, says the preacher. Or we can reword that. We can reword that into everything being a, just, just an unnecessary void as being something that is, is absolutely terminal. That something that is, is vanity is something that's vain. It's something that's useless. It's something that's pointless. Pointless. Vanity of vanities. Pointlessness of pointlessness. Uselessness of uselessness. Emptiness of emptiness. That's what life under the sun will provide if that's the life that you desire and only desire. If, you, if that is what you worship, then... That is all you're going to get. That's all you're going to get. Jesus continues, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven 
where neither, rust, uh, neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Here is firm treasure. Well, how is that done? All right? It's not done by currency on this earth, except in righteousness, in love, in showing compassion, in showing obedience to God in all things. That is laying up treasures in heaven. That is precisely what, is, what is, is being mentioned here with these treasures. These treasures are laid up there by what you do treasure. Treasuring God and His Messiah. Treasuring the words that He gives us as being precisely where our life must be built on. This is not a hobby. To some it is. This is not just something that uh, I will obey when it's convenient. Some do. This is complete, complete dedication to God. All your life, everything given to him given to him and their treasures are stored up in heaven now where your treasure is there your heart will be also i've known way way too many people in my lifetime that it it, it seemed like uh, their idea of life was very strange in my eyes and it was that all they were really looking forward to they were working their life so they wouldn't have to work anymore well that's going to take quite a while and, and they will have they will be retiring and then they can they can live the life that they always wanted to live but here's the thing no one is guaranteed another minute working toward that end and that is that's your whole purpose your whole purpose is just to, to not be able to work anymore that's your purpose could it be said that maybe you don't like your work <laughs> could it be said that maybe you have the wrong focus on things could it be said that that and i've known plenty of people that they never made it to retirement and i've also known others that they didn't they weren't retired for very long that it, it ended. You don't know. You don't know how long you've got on this earth. And so the treasures on this earth are pretty much meaningless. They're meaningless. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. If your treasure is in your, in your bank account, if that's where, you, that's where your heart is going to be, if that truly is your treasure, that's where your heart will be. And as we find from the New Testament, there's a lot of sorrow that comes from just basic money. There's some people that have been extraordinarily prosperous, but I, no one would call them happy. No one would. And there's also, I am very convinced, a mental illness that overtakes some of the very prosperous. I mean, for the rest of us, we couldn't have such a thing. <laughs> if we did, we, we, we couldn't be involved in it. But with some who are overwhelmingly prosperous, they, some, not, not all, they, they can't leave themselves alone. There's always plastic surgery and more plastic surgery and more, and they're spending thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars that they've got. The rest of us, we don't have that. But they've got, and it's like you have a mental illness. You cannot leave yourself alone. And with some of them, I've seen the results of, of just years of one treatment after another, one alteration after another. And it's like, I have no idea where you're from. There is no one else on earth that looks like you. There's nobody that uh, this is, you've got some extremely foreign traits that I don't think belong to humanity. You've got, you've got something going on here. And it is, it is this, this worship of, of course, that would be worship of, of your own body. 
but worship of, of wherever your treasure happens to be. Now, we just come back to this question, Lord, to whom shall we go? And we just try to fill in the blank. Try to fill in the blank in this. And the first one is very popular this day. And the answer to this is, this is like the worst place you could ever go. Don't ever get caught up in thinking that this is your answer. It's never your answer. Have you ever met a wicked person? Have you ever met someone who just cheated to, to win at a game? Have you ever met somebody who would just walk over anybody else to be successful? You think that doesn't attract them? You better believe it does. I actually uh, knew a man uh, years ago who was very honest. He, he wanted to become a, a senator, and I don't know that he ever did. He wanted to become a senator, and he told me, honestly, he said, because I want to have the, to be able to have financial gain out of it. I want to be able to, and I said, kickbacks? He said, yeah. He said that he was very, very honest about it. You think that this doesn't attract the very worst of people? Yes, it does. And our government does that? Yes, it does. All you have to do is to get yourself elected. That's it. That's all you have to do. And just as a side point, if I were the leader of another country, whatever that country is, I don't know that I would trust this nation too much because we're like a schizophrenic over here going from one extreme to another extreme, one extreme to another extreme, one extreme to another extreme. It's like you, can't, you cannot trust. You cannot trust this. That there, this is, that's an absurd, fatalistic replacement for God. And governments of the past, it would do you well to learn a little bit of history, not saying that you don't. It would do anyone well to learn how many of these. Now, Romans chapter 13, yes, yeah, civil government is legitimate. It's from God. That doesn't mean that every government, every head of government is doing precisely what God would want them to do. Saul, uh, uh, the first, of, first king of Israel, didn't do what God wanted him to do. Jeroboam didn't do, also anointed by God, didn't do what God wanted him to do. But how many of these have gone so far off the rail, they were destroying their own with glee. They were destroying their own happily. Stalin did it by the millions. On a whim, he would do it. But he's not the only one. He is not the only one that did it. There are Adolf Hitler did it. Pol Pot did it. Mao did it. There are numerous ones that predate them that did it. Wicked people can come to the head of governments and suddenly people begin to die. This is not anything you can hang your hat on. This is not anything. This is, this you think you can just trust people that somehow inherently this is going to be trustworthy? Like I said, anybody can get themselves elected. Anybody can. And those that will cheat, those that will lie, those can, wanting this will do all that to get it. Now, we come to this, and this was mentioned by uh, Wallace concerning money. Money will not buy you anything other than more material wealth. That's all I can buy you. Just, it's stuck on, on the material, that's it. That's all it can do. How many millionaires and billionaires are some of the most depressed people on earth? Some of the most paranoid people on earth? How is it that they get caught up in things that others simply don't get caught up in because this becomes, this becomes their master? Protecting this, making more of this, it is their entire focus. To whom shall we go? To this? Uh, that doesn't save you for anything. That, does, that cannot save you. That cannot give you spiritual strength. 
That cannot give you happiness. That cannot give you a better family or a better, it could give you a better house, but not a better home. And there's a lot of houses that are dream houses, but there's no, nothing home about it. There's nothing home about it. Oh, it's, it's a beautiful house. There is no mistaking that. But the people living in there, it's not a home. This, we all need this. We're just like we need money too. <laughs> but this cannot be worshipped. Yeah, we can educate ourselves. It's like uh, C.S. Lewis said, you, you take a, a devil, you take a devil and educate the devil and he becomes a better educated devil. This doesn't solve anything except just, once again, material things. This can, and of course it depends on what the education is. Education in the matters of God, education's, education in the Bible. Yeah, now that we need. That we need. But as far as secular education, okay, yes, that's necessary. But it must be put in perspective as to as far as it will give you and not expect it to, to be the end-all, be-all, because it can't. It cannot replace God. Just like science doesn't replace God. Science is supposed to be, supposed to be, looking at the creation of God. That's what science is supposed to be doing, examining that and understanding that. That's what science is supposed to be. Just like with education, education is supposed to make us into better people. Well, you have the proper education and you will be. Proper education that's going to include morality, going to include proper ethics, going to include absolute truths, and going to include God. You take God out of the lives of people, you cannot expect them to be godly. They won't be. They won't be. And with each successive generation, things will get worse. Bad to begin with, taking God out of people's lives, and it will only get worse. Which is precisely what the Bible told us is going to happen. Precisely. Uh, we mentioned that just briefly. We'll go on to this. Okay, here's a big word, Epicureanism. What is that? I might as well put it, I could have put it in hedonism if that helped but it's that of taking pleasure in whatever it is that gives you pleasure. Whatever it is. Epicureanism. Whatever, whatever thing, if it's, this would be in the thing of partying, this would be in the thing of, of eating, which we all have to eat, I understand that. This would be in the thing of drunkenness. This would be in, the, in whatever thing, hedonistic, whatever it is. Whatever gives you pleasure, well, that's where you go. That is Epicureanism. That is whatever makes me happy is good. Well, <laughs> is it? And they had a problem with it. Because what if what makes you happy? What if what makes you happy is baking pies and giving it to people? Is that good? Oh, yeah, I like your pies. All right. But what if what makes me happy is killing you? Is that good? Is it? That's what makes me happy. Is that good? There's, there's a major problem that is found in all of these things. Major problem because they do not bring real stability. They do not bring real happiness and they do not bring righteousness. They do not bring salvation. You have the words of life. Is what Peter said. And truly, they were and are the words of life. What about this one? Some people crave it. And as uh, David Foster Wallace stated concerning power, gaining power, you're always looking over your shoulder. He doesn't say that. Always looking over your shoulder. It used to be that I, was, I thought that kings and, the, and princes and the like always lived really good lives without much problem at all. And that's not true. Your basic peasant had a better home to go to than the kings did. Because the kings always... Your, your peasants, you think they had to have a food taster to see, did someone poison my food today? The kings did. 
peasants didn't. They knew the one who cooked that food. Well, that my wife, or that was my daughter, that was that was my mom, or that was whomever. They're not going to poison me. They, there's more security there. There's more security, and also that the concerning the kings and princes, that the one most likely to kill you is a relative. It could be a brother. It could be a cousin. This is something that can take over someone, and the more they get, the more they want. And the more they realize, others want it as well. That doesn't bring a good life at all. And once again, it does not give any kind of spirituality or salvation. And we come to this. Fame. There's a lot of famous people that they hate it. They hate it because they can't live a regular life. This is not a replacement of Christ. Neither is this, and this is where most people are guilty. Neither is that. You know something? The world will take every second of your life. Your employer will be happy if you spend every waking second on that. Very happy. They'll not tell you to stop. They'll never tell you to stop. Yes, you keep going. You're good. You keep going. You, you continue on this. And, and if you give them every second, they're not going to refuse it. You give them every ounce of your being, they're not going to refuse it. They're happy to have it. And here is a revelation that perhaps you may not realize. You do that, you do that, you've made yourself a slave to that. And all those other things will make you into a slave of it, to serve it, to serve money, to, to serve some, some power, to, to serve uh, whatever fame, whatever it is. It will turn you into, a, it's into its slave. Now, we just ask the next question. What did the people of John 6 turn to? If they didn't walk with Him anymore, if they didn't walk with Christ anymore, where did they go? What did they have? Now, aside from the things that we've already listed, let's just list some things in the first century that they would have had there in Palestine. All right, first off, you have the Jewish sects. They're going to go to the Jewish, Jewish sects. Well, that's the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, which aren't mentioned in the New Testament, but were in the first century right there with the others. They were much, much smaller. They're like a, they're like a monastic group, like monks is what they are. But, and there would have been others as well that we would know very little about if we know anything. They're going to go to those guys? They're going to go there? Because you have some pretty vile people in this. The Sadducees, I wonder if they even believe in God. Because there's a lot of things they didn't believe. They didn't believe in spirits. They didn't believe in a resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe, what, what did they believe? The Pharisees, the Pharisees would, they would take the, the laws of God and then they would crank them down, make it harder for you to live. And the Essenes even more so. But then you have that of the Jewish leaders. Go to the Jewish leaders, the, the high priests, the rabbis, the puppet kings, because they were, they were, they were signed there by Caesar. False prophets, violence. That's what you get with these leaders. That's what you get. You're going to leave Christ for these leaders, and none of them can provide much of any benefit at all. None. You, of course, have the Roman state. You have Roman influence. You have others that, of these Jewish leaders that would have been more political, such as the Herodians and the Zealots. And with the Zealots, there's your violence. With your Zealots, there is murder involved in that. But with your Roman state and Roman influence, you're going to go to Greek and, and Roman paganism? Is that what you're going to? There is the, the rest of the choices are bad. And there is only one good choice. 
Ecclesiastes 12, beginning in verse 13. Here is the conclusion of the book. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. The whole matter of the book. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all. This is what we're created to do. This makes us into the noble people God created us to be. This makes us into exactly what we were intended to be from, from our creation. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every single thing, whether good or evil. We are to serve God. And here is this warning. as the Old Testament. The Old Testament. He's going to bring every work into judgment. Every work. And Christ has been the one given that assignment. He is the one that has been chosen to be the judge. And that's exactly what He is going to do. When Christ returns, just as everything else that God has told us, the day of judgment will come true as well. When Christ returns, He will judge every one of us he has the authority and the right and all power to judge every action of every human that's ever lived, and he will do it. Well, how's he going to do that? Well, he's God. He knows it. He knows what everything is and how it's going to be judged. Now, he doesn't leave us in a lurch. He doesn't leave us in a, a major problem that he doesn't help to, to solve. He, he resolves it completely. We can know what we're going to be judged by. We can know because we have the standard and he tells us it's the standard. He doesn't leave this without telling us directly this is what we're going to be judged by. This is it. This isn't just some, some helpful uh, advice. This is precisely the standard we're going to be judged by. He's given us everything we need. He's given us the words. He's given us the means. He's given us everything. It's, and all of it's been done before we were even born. All of it. And we truly have no excuse. And we will stand before Him one day and give an account. For the things that we have done one day the words are for us they've been given centuries ago but to every generation it is their time to obey in every generation it is their opportunity to turn to God grace is given to each and every year each and every generation, each and every century, it comes now to us. This is our time to accept Him. The words do precisely what they did in the first century. Save souls. Change hearts. Lift the human spirit. Lifting us into something better, into being a child of God and to join in the works of those that went before us, of not just the apostles, but of the prophets that go all the way back through time. The words are here, and with that we can develop faith in them, or not, it's up to our will. Develop faith in them, and they teach us what we are to do. They teach us directly that we are to repent of our sins, confess Jesus as the Christ, be willing to make that confession, that Jesus is the Christ, and to be baptized, and our sins are taken away. They are washed away, exactly as Paul said his sins were washed away in Acts 22, 16. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. 
That's precisely what he was told. That's exactly how he recounts it. Was it true? Yes. Is it still true today? Yes. And we are raised to newness of life, brought into his church, his kingdom, his family, and live for him for the rest of our existence, which goes into eternity. This morning, we ask, if you need to respond to the invitation, that you come as we stand and sing.